Do you think that you're being paid enough for your current job? Maybe you work in an office or a shop. Maybe you're a waiter or waitress. You work hard and think that you deserve more money than you're currently on. But do you think this is also the case for MPs? Do they also deserve a pay rise? Do they work hard and deserve more compensation for their work? Well, that's what we're going to discuss in today's video. And if you think that we should be paid more, then consider backing us on Patreon. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking. We obviously invest donations into more videos and journalism. And in return, you get access to bonus content, exclusive live streams and more. To sign up, the link is in the description. Whenever it's announced that MPs are getting a pay rise in the media, people tend to get quite frustrated. And that's understandable, considering that MPs are currently on a salary of £81,932 a year, approaching triple the £31,461 median salary in the UK. And this is without taking into account the very generous expenses that MPs are entitled to. However, it's important to consider when we're having debates like these that MPs don't actually decide on their expenses themselves. Instead, their pay is determined by the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority, a body which was created in 2009 following the expenses scandal. Prior to its creation, it was down to MPs to decide on their own level of pay and expenses, a responsibility that's been taken away from them now. Irrespective of who actually pays MPs, generally people don't like to see the number increase. For example, in 2015, MPs received a pay rise of £7,000, from about £67,000 to £74,000. And this was at a time when the Conservatives were still implementing austerity policies. Policies that were really squeezing the pay of many across the country. The thing was, the MPs didn't ask or give themselves this pay rise. It was given to them by an independent body. MPs originally created the body to try and avoid them being criticised for receiving more pay, but in doing so, someone else makes the decision and they still get the blame. To be fair to the critics though, as with all pay, MPs aren't obligated to take it. But let's take a look at how MPs' pay has changed over time. As you can see in this graph, MPs' pay has steadily increased since 2010, with the rather large jump we mentioned earlier from 2015. To understand why the IPSA increases MPs' wages at the rate it does, we need to understand the metrics they use. The best place to start here is by looking at the graph's 2015 bump, because, as we said, it seems fishy considering that the rest of the country was struggling through austerity measures. Essentially, the IPSA came to the £7,000 pay increase after an analysis of four separate factors. And some of these factors were actually used by the IPSA's predecessor, the Senior Salaries Review Body. The first metric, as previously used by the SSRB, looked at MPs' pay in relation to other professional bodies. The specific professions they tracked pay increases of were a head teacher, a police superintendent, a pay band one senior civil servant, a second tier county council officer, a colonel and an HR director in an NHS organisation. The second metric they used was looking at national average earnings. The IPSA predicted that if MPs' pay from 2007 was kept in line with national earnings increases, then their pay would increase to £73,365. And at the time the report was written in 2013, MPs were only being paid £66,396, lagging behind the national average increase. The third metric looked at how MPs' pay stacks up against the average UK salary over time. The IPSA found that between 1911, when MPs were first paid for their work, and 1980, when pay became a lot more complicated due to the introduction of MPs' expenses, MPs earned 3.16 times the national average. But, as the IPSA pointed out in 2013, this had slipped to only 2.7 times the national average. The last factor to be included was a report by the former head of the SSRB. This report argued that MPs' pay should be determined by changes in public sector earnings. And based on a PwC report from 2007, it was found that if this were the case, then MPs should be earning around £79,122 in 2015. 
So, using these four factors, the IPSA determined in 2013 that in two years' time, MPs should be paid between £73,365 and £83,430. Ultimately, due to the fact that the country was going through austerity measures, they decided on a figure of £74,000, on the lower end of the scale. And this is where the 2015 MP pay bump comes from. Since 2015, though, the IPSA have used a slightly cleaner way of determining pay. Instead of having a number of factors in their judgment, they've linked MP pay to an ONS series which documents the increase in pay in the public sector, known as the KAC9 series. Specifically, the KAC9 series looks at the seasonally adjusted three-month average mean of percentage year-on-year -year change in average weekly earnings for the public sector. And it's this complex average which is applied to MPs' pay. As this chart shows, since 2015, public sector workers have received a pay increase of between 1 and 2% 2 between 2015 and 2017, and then around 3% in 18 and 19. And if we look at this chart of MPs' pay, you can see that it maps onto it quite nicely. And this is the justification being used for MPs' pay rises by those who have recommended and implemented it. Regardless, there's obviously still a lot of criticism of this, and when we look into it, we can see why. If we use 2007 figures, prior to the IPSA and expenses scandal as a baseline, we can see that MPs' wages were slipping behind both median UK salary and the median public sector salary. In every year since 2015, though, MPs' pay has increased by a larger percentage than both the median UK salary and the median UK public sector salary. So, one criticism of the IPSA as an organisation is that all they've done is ensure that MPs' pay is increased at a greater rate than average workers. While MPs' pay was increasing at a slower rate than average workers up until 2015, their decision to boost MPs' pays by so much that year has overcorrected, and now MPs are being given a bigger pay rise than other workers overall. So, these are the arguments for whether the IPSA's previous pay rises were fair or not, and you can let us know what you think in the comments below. But let's talk more generally now about MPs' pay and whether it's fair for them to be paid so much to begin with, and whether their huge paychecks should actually be maintained going forward. And it's a difficult question, because being an MP is a tough job. A lack of job security, a huge level of accountability, and a demonstrable risk of abuse towards you and your family. All of which is largely unrelated to your actual performance in the job. A good MP is one that has a good work ethic, cares about their constituents and country, has a grounding in the real world, and has some technical expertise to bring to the chamber. But such candidates are in high demand in other professions too. And as they're in high demand, they'll likely be highly paid as well. A lawyer at the top of their field can expect to earn in excess of £100,000 for example. So, to ensure that the legislature can entice such candidates, it needs to make sure that pay is competitive. Therefore, it only makes sense that MPs' pay increases with other public sector workers to ensure that pay remains competitive and they continue bringing in the right kinds of people. However, the other side of this argument is that MPs shouldn't be taking this job for the money. MPs are already well paid enough, and they shouldn't be paid more while people like nurses are receiving real terms pay cuts. Moreover, the reputational damage that can and has been inflicted on the House of Commons when MPs seemingly get unfair pay rises could be more of a concern than the slight overall decrease in wages for individual MPs. If you subscribe to this opinion, then there's a fair chance that you believe that MPs' pay shouldn't be increased at the rate they currently are and perhaps they should even be decreased. A writer in the New Statesman actually suggested that MPs should have their pay increases linked to household incomes, instead of public sector incomes. This way, they'd be incentivized to increase average household pay, and unlike the creation of the IPSA, and it would mean that they'd likely avoid any criticism when it comes to future pay increases. But is this a good idea? Should MPs be paid more? And should we change the way that pay increases are determined? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you want to get even more involved, then you can also back us on Patreon. 
In exchange for a monthly donation, you can get things like exclusive live streams, the ability to choose our video topics, behind the scenes posts, your name at the end of videos, and much more. So if you'd like to support the content we make, then the link is in the description. We'd really appreciate your support. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a new video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that is in the description.